This video is going over the top 9 great Mark DeCascos movies that are lost in time. Hey guys, my name is Chris. Don't forget to hit the notification button so you don't miss our daily uploads. Mark DeCascos is living proof of the truth of Palo, quote, When you want something, all the universe conspires in helping you to achieve it. Walking on the streets of Chinatown in San Francisco, he was noticed by the assistant director to Wayne Wang and was cast in a small role in the film Dim Sum. Though the scenes did not make it to the final cut, Mark DeCascos was introduced to Hollywood and his skills as an all-American martial artist were appreciated by many directors in the later years. Now, as a child whose parents were both martial arts trainers, he started training from a very early age and won several tournaments, including the European and Italian Kung Fu and Karate Championships, both in 1982. DeCascos likes to call himself a typical Hawaiian local boy, but is way more international than many of us. He's essentially a man of the world, hailing from Japanese, Chinese, Filipino, Spanish, and Irish ancestries. At a time when martial arts was synonymous with Asian characters, we had an American who excelled in styles such as Woon Hop Kyun Du, Kung Fu, Karate, Muay Thai, Tai Chi, Capoeira, and Wushu. Such an abundance of talents hardly goes unnoticed, and he bagged his first role as Stoner's Driver in the 1990 film Angel Town and has since come a long way, starring in the super action flick John Wick, Parabellum as Zero. Aside from films, DeCascos has starred in numerous TV shows like Iron Chef America, Lucifer, and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. In this video, we'll talk about the nine of his forgotten gems that deserve more appreciation than they initially received. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Crying Freeman, 1995. Emu O'Hara becomes this sole witness of a murder of a Japanese Yakuza member by a master assassin called Yo. He's a proficient killer, but sheds tears of remorse and regret every time he takes a life. Emu is captivated by his charm and persona, but later learns that his job as a death bringer working for the Chinese criminal organization called the Sons of the Dragon. Now the organization hypnotized him and now wants Emu dead. Do it quickly, without thought. However, Yo and Emu fall in love and they stay together. They'll have to escape their past lives, evading several violent forces who intend to capture and control Yo. Now, Crying Freeman was a manga written by noted Japanese writer Kazu Koika and was illustrated by Ryoechi Ikagami. The film is directed by Christoph Gaines and his debut and most honest and passionate reflection of the manga. Despite a relatively low budget, the film feels rich due to the efficient camera work and Christoph's impressive vision. Mark DeCasco stars in and as Crying Freeman. His performance is a healthy reflection of his talents as a veteran martial artist. There was very little use of stuntmen, and Mark chose to do almost all his own stunts, which added hugely to the realism of the film. <laughs> Essentially, it is a romantic drama decorated with concrete action. Mark and Julie Condra, who play Emu, are unquestionable on-screen chemistry, a fact solidified by the couple's marriage in 1998. The film was shot in various exotic locations including Vancouver, Japan, and China, so the audience is rewarded with a visually rich film, bursting with high-octane action, though it comes with a flawed screenplay and an exaggeration of the Yakuza code and honor. This can be attributed to the inexperience of Christoph as a director, something that was less of an issue in his next project with DeCascos, Brotherhood of the Wolf. Anybody know where I can buy a hot Mercedes? <laughs> Only the Strong, 1993. Louis Steven returns from a tour with the United States Army Special Forces, only to find that his former high school has become home to a den of drug dealers. Selling me products, or you'll be sorry. Now pick it up. Led by Kingpin, Silvero. The dealers have no fear of being caught by the authorities and carry out their nefarious activities in broad daylight. Now, as a skilled martial artist and ex student, Lewis worries for the school and its students. First of all, 
I ain't a teacher. Second, I'm in a real shitty mood. Steven takes on the criminals, and while he's at it, he inspires the youth with his talents. The film marks Mark DeCascos' first major break as a lead character. Lovers of martial arts will fall for his well-choreographed performances of Capoeira, a mix of Afro-Brazilian martial arts and aerobic dance. Mark had no prior knowledge of Capoeira, but learned it from Eamon Santo for the film. Though his performance is hard to distinguish from that of a professional, it's disappointing that despite it being one of the most cinematic dance forms, Capoeira hasn't found its way into more films. De Cascos displays grace and strength in this inspiring story of a man who is armed only with sheer resolve and skills. His lean and muscular body fits the requirements demanded by Capoeira's athleticism. Only the strong is not one of your run-of-the-mill teen flicks, and succeeds in letting the audience bathe in hope and optimism. It will leave you smiling as the credits roll, satisfying the prime objective of any piece of cinema. In a light-hearted movie with a good deal of flawless Afro-Brazilian martial arts, director Sheldon Ledich adds a touch of the unconventional. Even for martial arts fans, the Asian fighting styles of Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan can eventually feel a little monotonous, and so the introduction of the Hawaiian actor is a sweet reprieve. Drive, 1997. Toby Wong was experimented upon and turned into a cyborg by the Leung Corporation, the mean piece of technology. The Turbo device gives him superhuman speed, stamina, and strength. Now, after issues crop up between him and the nefarious firm, Wong decides to flee to Los Angeles, where an American tech company will remove the implant and buy the Turbo device from him. However, all is not well, as Leung Corporation's head, Mr. Lau, has sent a band of American mercenaries to capture Wong and retrieve the invaluable piece of technology. Now Wong joins forces with a divorced and aspiring songwriter, Malik Brody, in the quest for promising him half the money. Look, I'll make you a deal. Please, Monty Hall, no deals. No, 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 listen. No deals. All you do is you help me get to LA, I'll give you half the money, what do you say? The two begin a speedy drive from San Francisco to Los Angeles, but the mercenaries are not the only enemies they encounter. What do we need from an action film? High-speed chase sequences? Gripping martial arts fights? Bullets flying everywhere? And some comedy to ease the adrenaline rush. Drive has all of this and more. Steve Wang probably directed this one from the point of view of an action fan. The film looks elegantly shot for a mere 3.5 million, and Mark deserves the credit. He's fast, skilled, and graceful in fight sequences. <laughs> <laughs> while displaying excellent comic timing with scene partner Kadeem Hardison. Some critics arguably compare it to the Rush Hour series, but the chemistry between DeCascos and Hardison arises out of their sweet radical differences. At no point does the humor seem forced. In fact, very few action stars have the conscious knowledge to pull off comedy. Mark shows his versatility as an actor here, and demonstrates that he deserves to be a more celebrated actor than he currently is. Interestingly, Mark went on to play another sci-fi character as Kung Lao in Mortal Kombat Legacy. You can find it on the web. Brotherhood of the Wolf, 2001. The story is set in a flashback where Marcus Dapscher is writing a memoir. In 1764, a rural French province of Gavodin was plagued by the deadly beast that was killing locals. King Louis sent Gregory de Fronsac and his friend Minnie to investigate and capture the beast. While investigating, Fronsac discovers an elaborate conspiracy by a secret society called the Brotherhood of the Wolf, which is using the last surviving descendant of an African creature to erode public support for the king and arrange a coup. Fronsac and Manny increase their efforts to get the beast and set traps. Later, Manny discovers an underground cemetery that's being used by the Brotherhood to cage the beast. He is soon attacked by them and dies while fighting valiantly. Fronsac now teams up with Sylvia, an Italian girl at the local brothel. Though there's more to her than meets the eye. 
for the capture of the beast? Is capturing it enough to stop the Brotherhood from furthering their rebellious plan? This is the second project worked on by both director Christoph Gaines and Mark Dacascos, who plays Manny, the American Indian beast killer. He's a kickboxing and headbutting martial arts expert who fights bad guys in the 18th century French setting. The isolated fight sequences are a treat for the eyes. Courtesy of our Hawaiian boy style and energy. Though here it is dressed in a tricorn and beautiful French overcoat, Gaines made an entertaining portion out of Brotherhood of the Wolf, mixing together numerous genres. French cinema may be known for the prestigious Festival de Cannes, and this film certainly didn't win the coveted Palme d'Or. But hey, who doesn't like a visually stunning slasher flick where leads slay beasts and fight with style to save the nation from a political meltdown? We at Marvelous Videos sure love such films. And this is one of the best films you haven't watched. Double Dragon, 1994. Thousands of years ago in ancient China, an evil army of shadow warriors terrorized the great city of Shangse. To save his people, the good king sacrificed himself to create a mystical medallion. Realizing the ultimate powers of the medallion, the king split it in half. The one son he gave the power over body, to the other, power over the soul. This is the legend of the double dragon. Koga Shuko narrates these words at the beginning of the film. He's a corrupt businessman who tends to acquire both medallions and rule over the destructed city of New Angeles. After an earthquake, the city of San Diego and Los Angeles merged into one, and the disaster led to a sorry state of law and order. Gangsters run the city in a setup reminiscent of the purge. Shuko already has the soul medallion. This is only half of it. Where is the second dragon? And attacks the martial arts expert brother Jimmy and Billy Lee, who have the other half. With the medallion, Shuko can possess the souls of his enemies. Now the villain gets hold of Jimmy and pits him against his brother. Are blood bonds stronger than magic? The film is based on a hand-to-hand -hand combat game of the same name developed by Technos Japan. It was made for martial arts and fantasy film fans, and in the capacity, the film does great, maybe more than it meant to. Mark Dacascos and Scott Wolf star as Jimmy and Billy Lee. Mark kicks less ass in this one, and it tends to be the cheesiest film on the list, but it is super fun nonetheless. Based on a video game, Double Dragon was never supposed to take itself seriously, and it never does. There are plenty of comic scenes throughout that will make you roll on the floor with laughter. <laughs> we would have included this in our so bad that it's good list of films, if not for DeCasco's effortless fighting, flawless acrobatics, and unparalleled energy, which saves the movie from disgrace. Please, Neil Ling, have mercy. Whatever you're going to say, Make it the truth. You may not have another opportunity. Cradle to the Grave, 2003. A gang of American jewelry thieves led by Anthony Fay carries out a heist, stealing some black diamonds at the behest of Christoph. Agent Sue, an agent from the Taiwanese government, is hot on their trail, but they manage to escape. Sue wants the diamonds for himself as they hold more than just monetary value and Kristoff is murdered by the man he's working for, a kingpin named Yao Ling, who also takes a keen interest in the diamonds. The stones? The exchange was just robbed. Well, let's hope that was part of the plan. Agent Su catches up to Fei, and the two team up to fight Ling's henchmen, who had come for Fei. They later discover that Ling has kidnapped Fei's daughter and seeks the diamonds as ransom. Fei and Sue team up once more against the common enemy. The world is divided into two kinds of people. First, there are the ones who have seen and fallen in love with Cradle to the Grave, and the second, who haven't had the opportunity to do so. This action crime drama is studded with stars including Jet Li as Sue, DMX as Fei, and DeCascos as the terrific villain Ling. Li and DeCascos starring in the same movie and as opponents in nothing short of a wet dream for the martial arts fans. Did we mention that Kelly Hu from X-Men 2 is here too? We think movies like these are as good as their villains. DeCascos and Kelly wonderfully built up the terror quotient and became quite a frightening pair. Now the climax scene has an American and Singaporean martial arts muscles clashing against one another. And with that on screen, we hardly think that the viewer would want anything else.
Sabotage, 1996. Bishop is sent to Bosnia on a mission to save hostages from a terrorist group, although he's shot by a hitman named Sherwood, and he loses the hostages. Years later, he is hired by a millionaire to be a bodyguard. We'll be disembarking in a few minutes. Thanks, Michael. But Sherwood kills this guy too. Bishop is framed as the bad guy, and as is customary, the FBI is called. Agent Castle leads the investigation, but learns that Bishop is not the real culprit. The two are caught in a multi-agency game of chess that their names Bishop and Castle indicate. In yet another lost gem of suspenseful thriller, DeCascos gives a gripping performance. From the moment Sherwood, played by Tony Todd, fires a bullet that hits multiple targets at the beginning of the film, the tone is set. And again, we are constantly reminded that this isn't just any action flick. This is a game of chess. Unlike DeCasco's other films, this one is essentially a thriller, overflowing with twists, turns, and agency politics. Writers Rick Vallon and Michael Stokes put in a commendable effort creating the subplots and the little details that might go unnoticed. For instance, Bishop makes a warming alarm out of a lamp in his room. This is the kind of creative thinking that we take notice of in high-budget films. The film doesn't rely too heavily on technology or visual effects, just good old thinking. Action sequences come in every 10 to 15 minutes, as one should expect from a film like this, but these are well choreographed and don't feel forced or out of place. We guess action is like poop. If you have to force it, it's probably crap. Finally, the relationship between the two leads is not conventional. No, they don't hit it off and have sex. As the colleagues work on the case, respect and admiration builds. It is a realistic approach towards the male-female dynamic, considering the world that they are operating in is one of conspiracies and bullets. <laughs> Boogie Boy, 1998. A couple of months after Jesse Page is released from prison, he goes to meet his ex cellmate, Larry Story, who buys Jesse a motorbike to celebrate. Well, this is yours? Shit, no, Kimusabi. This is yours. They ride together to a pub where a singer named Jerk is playing, but in a strange turn of events, her drummer falls asleep and Jesse steps in as a replacement. Jerk offers Jesse a job drumming for the band an opportunity to leave his old ways behind. But Jesse is a man of loyalty and wishes to help his friend in one last drug deal. The deal goes south and bodies start piling up. The two prison mates find refuge in a secluded motel, but the bad guys are hot on their trail. The climax holds a bloodbath. The film ran into a bit of controversy after Imperial Entertainment used the phrase, the Academy Award winning writer of Pulp Fiction brings you. Now in reality, Roger Avery was one of the executive producers of this film, and his creative input may have been exaggerated. He did it as a favor to the film's writer, Craig Haman, and both Hammond and Avery were displeased by the media's house attentions grabbing an untruthful publicity. Having said that this thriller does seem to be fashioned along similar lines as Tarantino's work, both the camera work and the screenplay show a real resemblance. Now, Boogie Boy does well in terms of action and has a decent storyline. In oversimple terms, the film is a violent and action-packed character study of Jesse, played by DeCascos, in a surprisingly mature performance. Particularly interesting is one scene in which Jesse and Larry are lying in bed and caressing each other. The theme of homosexuality is subtle and delicately dealt with, leaving the viewer to draw their own conclusions. Sanctuary, 1998. Luke Kovac used to work for a black ops division inside the CIA, tasked with doing some government's dirty work, blackmail and assassinations. After one of his colleagues is sacrificed by his organization, he learns of the expendability of himself and his team. He goes rogue, stealing a tape that holds dirty secrets, and disguises himself as a priest named Father John. When his picture is published in the local newspaper to commend his social service activities, a former agent and lover, Rachel, tips him off that the Black Ops Division plan to hunt him down and retrieve the tape. The ex-super assassin will have to fight his fellow men to survive. Tiborg Takaxis is able to make very good use of a skilled actor, 
probably because this was their fourth project together after Deathline, Sabotage, and Deadly Past. Sanctuary is a movie with a solid storyline and thrill factor, on par with any other big-budget spycraft film of the time. Featured here is that trademark DeCasco's fighting style, but with more guns. He's the main reason to watch Sanctuary. Transitioning here from a mere action star to a fully rounded actor, Takax is a horror legend, and his lighting is reminiscent of the Italian horror director Bava. Just like Bava, Takax gets a gloomy tone through the color and lighting, helping build incredible suspense. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to leave a like, a comment, and subscribe to this channel. Till next time.